Hello, gentle students, gentle readers of the novel Dream of the Red Chamber, Hong Lo Meng, uh, often called, uh, called Shi Tou Ji, Story of the Stone. Uh, today, I, my goal is really to provide a general, very general introduction to the novel itself, and maybe talk about the, the uh, fundamental characters and some of the basic themes in really 20 to 30 minutes. But um, again, this lecture series is intended for people who come to the novel more or less for the first time, or people maybe who've read it, but who are reading it again, or who would like to know more about this novel that so many of us love uh, very much. This novel has been uh, something that I often will, will uh, have moments of spontaneous laughter as I'm sitting on my, my chair. And uh, I wonder sometimes what everyone around me might think as I burst into laughter. So today, uh, just a few things, uh, I'd like to share just a few things about the novel itself by way of a more of an introduction to the text. It's really, again, and I, maybe I've said this already, but it's considered China's greatest uh, masterpiece, especially its greatest masterpiece as, as a novel. It's first officially published, and, and by the way, I should also say that Throughout this lecture series, some of the things I'll be talking about presently in this lecture will reappear be, on, on purpose because many of these things that I'll mention today should be uh, uh, revisited throughout the lecture series so that uh, they're a bit more solidified. But in any case, this, this novel was officially, let me under, underscore officially, uh, officially published in 1791 with prefaces by, by two uh, scholars. Officially published nearly three decades, nearly thirty years after Cao Shuiqin's death, uh, and the the two the two uh, versions with these prefaces by these two scholars were provided by Cheng Weiyuan and Gao E. And Cheng, Wei, Cheng Weiyuan lived about 1742 until I think I wrote this down 1818, and Gao E 1742 about 1815. Between between Cao Shuiqin's death. And its publication in 1791, the unfinished manuscript of the novel Hong Among was circulated to a number of what we might call the novel's aficionados. Uh, this copy included a commentary by someone using the pen name uh, Zhi Yan Zai, which means a red inkstone. So there is this commentary. And uh, um, copies of the manuscript eventually reached the open market and were sold for quite a large amount of money. It was a very popular and very expensive book. But the copy that was circulated with commentary by Zhi Yanzhai, by Red Inkstone, only reached chapter 80. And as we know, the chapter has 120 chapters, so there are 40 extra chapters after. Even the word extra is a problem, but there are 40 chapters after chapter 80. Um, but, the, but by chapter 80, 80 the, the story is completely unresolved. Um, Cheng Weiyuan and Gao E claimed to have uh, a finished ending. And, uh, but their ending was derided by some as uh, dog fur or dog skin, go pee. Sounds a little bit like a, 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 it's like a homophone for the word dog fart, right? So, so people who looked at the last 40 chapters, some of them, derided it as, as, as drivel. So who really wrote the last 40 chapters of Home Among is hotly debated. There are people who absolutely insist that Cao Shuiqin had written it, uh, and there are people who absolutely insist that he did not write it. So that debate, uh, that's, debate still continues. There's an academic discipline. I may have said this in another uh, lecture, or will say it again, but there's an ac academic uh, discipline called Hong Jia, which means redologists, people who study the novel A Dream of the Red Chamber. And uh, again, at, at my own uh, uh, university where I studied uh, as an undergraduate and as a graduate student, there was an entire section of, uh, uh, of the, the East Asian Languages and Literatures library part uh, that was dedicated to, to Hong Shui Jia to, to, in Chinese, dedicated to red studies, to the studies of my cats, if you hear sounds, my cats are, are rather uh, um, excitedly tussling uh, on their cat tower, which is just beyond your view. 
Anyway, uh, any moment now they could come to my desk here and cause some kind of a, a turbulence uh, in this in this these precincts here. Now, um, one of the things that I think is crucial to thinking about this novel is that no one really can agree about what the novel is about. And what are its themes? Is it a love story? Certainly there's that dimension. Is it Bilbo's Roman? Is it the story of a young man's journey toward uh, enlightenment? Is it a Buddhist Taoist tale of enlightenment? Uh, is it really a work of uh, what we might call a novel of manners? Is it something uh, that is was written to discuss social observation, to discuss uh, culture? Uh, is, looking, was a, so is it observing uh, social conventions? Um, or is it an allegory about the decay of the, of the Qing dynasty in, in general? But what most uh, scholars agree is that the novel itself functions as largely an autobiography of the novelist, the, of the author Cao Xueqin. That is, Jia Baoyu, the uh, protagonist of the entire work, is essentially um, uh, Cao Xueqin himself. And there are many, many reasons to um, accept that argument. Um, and then some people actually argue that it's a veiled criticism of the Qing court, of the Manchu court itself. It's a specific critique of, of the imperial clan at that time. Well, the story begins in a very interesting way. It begins with, uh, with an account of the attachment between two... Um, preternatural beings. There is the divine luminescent, the divine luminescent stone in waiting, um, and then there is another being that we call, uh, we translate as crimson pearl flower. Um, so the, the, the divine luminescent stone in waiting, as the text uh, uh, calls him, uh, is the stone uh, in the novel, who's given magical powers by the goddess Nuwa, for the repair of the vault of heaven. Um, that will be discussed uh, in the next lecture, actually, the whole idea of new one, this mythology. But this, this stone ends up being an extra stone and is not used in the wall by Nuwa. And it's, uh, the stone is left aside and a Buddhist monk and a Taoist cleric take the stone uh, and and, um, and 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 they they sort of send it to live as a young boy in a wealthy family, the Jia family. So Jia Baoyu is the incarnation of this of this divine luminescent stone in waiting, uh, and then his name is is Jia Baoyu. Baoyu is born with a jade stone actually in in his mouth with writing on it, a kind of apotropaic or a demon, a, 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 a saying that scares evil away, that, that keeps demons at bay. But while the stone was in its previous existence, right, when it was in the, 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 uh, the supernatural precincts, uh, when it was in its previous existence, it was attracted to a very delicate plant growing beside a magic river, Linghe, kind of as, it, Ling he, as it's, it's uh, called in, in Chinese. Um, and that, that is, is crimson pearl flower. The stone fancies the crimson pearl flower and waters her every day with sweet dew. Uh, now, absolutely, there is a sexual implication behind this act of, of, of watering the flower with, with dew. Um, one sees similar references in, in, in poetry that have erotic connotations. Uh, but this fairy girl, this flower, right, she's born in the world as Lin Dayu. So in some sense, people like to interpret the novel, many do, as a, a romance, a rather fraught romance between Lin Dayu, the crimson pearl flower, and Jia Baoyu, the luminescent stone in, in waiting. But in the novel, Lin Dayu is Baoyu's beautiful cousin, and she's the perfect beauty according to the cult of Qing. Uh, she's frail, uh, she's weakly, uh, rather sick. She moves into the Jia household after her mother dies and she meets Baoyu in the, in the story. They were intimates before becoming human. Uh, 
in the previous in their previous ex existence. So the purpose of her human life, according to the novel, is literally to repay the stone for its kindness through a quote debt of tears. One, at least I do, run can theoretically grow quite weary with the um, incessant weeping of Lin Dayu throughout the novel. But there it is. As you read the novel, if you're reading it for the first time, um, uh, perhaps someone should underline how often Lin Dayu cries through the novel. I would be interested to know how, how what, what, your, what your number is. But the novel shifts between worlds of, the, of, of divine and, and mortal throughout its narrative. One moment will be in the divine precincts and the next moment will be here in the very the, the, the very sort of day-to-day -day mundane uh, 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 world of, of humans. The novel uh, often will switch uh, from one realm to the next through the convention of dreams. Thus the novel Hong Lo Meng, Hong Red Lo Chambers Meng, Dream. The novel is set at Two Duke Street in Beijing, in the capital. Uh, there's some interesting um, relationship between Beijing and Nanjing in the novel. Uh, people who carefully read the novel will notice that uh, there is a conflation of them, and some argue that Cao Shui Qin is mistakenly, uh, in his, he, he intends, the, intends the, the family to be in Nanjing, but it's actually in Beijing, and so there are errors in the novel that that um, one can, can discern at certain points in terms of where the novel is set. Now, um, the two dukes are connected by a common ancestor, uh, the Rongguo house, which is uh, Jia Baoyu's home, which is very Confucian, right? The Rongguo house will represent a, a Confucian sense. The patriarch of that household is Jia Zheng, a Confucian. And then the Ningguo house, which the patriarch of that house is Taoist. So you see a kind of Taoist and Confucian a parallel or, or, or dichotomy being produced in these two houses. And they're finally connected together in chapter 17 and 18 uh, when, they're, when they're, the family will build a garden. There is a garden constructed called the Daguan Yuan, the, the uh, Prospect Garden, as uh, David Hawkes translates it. And um, the garden is built to accommodate a visit from the imperial concubine Yuan Chun, who is the eldest daughter of uh, Jia Zheng, who's from the uh, Rongguo house. Uh, of course, Yuan Chun requests that the girls in the family move into the garden, and uh, Jia Baoyu is also asked to move into the garden, which is a curious thing because they are of that age, wherein they're coming of age. So there is some issues of propriety that are um, considered throughout the, the, the narrative of the garden. The, the garden becomes a site of picnics and poetry contests, eating venison and crab and the like. Um, the young adolescents are more aware of their adult desires as the, as the, as the narrative continues, uh, as they grow, and the, the, the problem of attachment uh, grows more uh, common within the narrative. The problem of desire will grow more common. And here we have a very significant reality within the narrative. That is um, the concept of Yu. And Jia Baoyu uh, is the name Jia Baoyu and the name Lin Daiyu, the two main characters really. Um, the last character in their name, Yu, is Jade. So Jia Baoyu um, sounds an awful lot and actually says, Jia who treasures Jade. Lin Daiyu sounds a bit like Lin who Dai, who carries Jade, Daiyu. But uh, the character Jade sounds like the character you desire. And that homophone, that homophone, that connection between the two is very specific and very intentional in the novel. So um, in the novel itself, we're going to have homophones, many, many homophones that I'll discuss in a future lecture, but these homophones will um, quite often conjure the notion of, of desire. Eventually, the relationship between Jia Baoyu and Lin Dayu is, <clears throat> is complicated by a third person who comes into the, the, the novel, and that is Xue Bao Chai, who is a, another girl, and Bao Chai has a golden locket that is uh, 
connected to Jia Bao Yu's <coughs> jade stone that he's born with in his mouth, and that the golden locket Bao Chai and the jade stone Bao Yu, uh, of Bao Yu's will be, uh, will, will be seen as a, a pair. And, and those two as a pair will also be uh, something of an important dimension within the narrative of the novel. It reaches its climax in chapters 97, 98, uh, more or less, but that's something for a future, uh, a future discussion. Um, the novel ends in a way that is pondered by all uh, readologists, and uh, um, people really uh, still debate the intended meaning of the novel's ending, if you know, depending upon who actually wrote that ending. Now, I should make a few uh, thematic and structural remarks. The novel is extremely complex in its structure, which is why um, there's an entire academic discipline of Dream in the Red Chamber studies in, in China. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, Western scholars too will spend a great deal of time thinking about the novel and, and, and lecturing about the novel as I am at this moment. But the novel has hundreds of characters. So if you, if you read the Chinese version, uh, I don't think my version has has uh, 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 it does not have a, a a chart in the back with the main characters. But certainly, if you read David Hawkes' version, there is uh, a list in the back and a, and, a, and a family tree where you can see who the characters are in the novel. They're in the novel. There are hundreds and hundreds of characters and. Um, in literary jargon, we call this the so-called billiards technique. That is, there are all of these characters, and as one plays billiards, the billiard ball sort of interact and hit one another at random times, or not so random times, or not so random times, I think is a better way to emphasize this in, in the novel. But, but the characters of the novel are, are many, and their relationships are complicated, and characters will come and go at very significant, uh, significant times. So some of the main characters are old grandmother Jia. She's uh, uh, inspired uh, perhaps by Jia Baoyu's mother, if his mother was Lady Li. And not Jia Baoyu, I mean Cao Xue Qin's mother, if his mother was Lady Li. Uh, but, but there is old grandmother Jia, there is Jia Baoyu, there is Lin Daiyu, there's Xue Bao Chai, and then there is uh, 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 the character Wang Xifang. And Wang Xifeng uh, is uh, really an entertaining character throughout the novel. Uh, Well-behaved and ill-behaved, uh, brilliant and foolish, clever and, well, always clever, actually. In any case, uh, she's connected to the, the color red. Um, she's connected to peppers. She's connected to fire. She's connected to summer. Uh, pay very close attention to, uh, to Wang Xifeng uh, through the novel. And it, the novel is, is, is quite famous for its rich and detailed descriptions of, chi of, of Chinese elite life. Uh, there are long descriptions of clothes, of plays, of games, of etiquette, of food, of medicine, of fortune telling, of rituals, uh, long discussions of certain books, stories, uh, and, and uh, drama. So uh, the novel itself you know, one in, in literary terms, we think in terms of mimesis and digesis, right? That is, mimesis being being the the the, the representation of reality. Uh, what makes it mimetic? What makes it seem real? And digesis, the narration. And how is it narrated? Um, well, narration and representation are crucially mixed together throughout uh, uh, the reading of a text such as this. So um, uh, as I sort of approach uh, uh, my conclusion here, this novel has many other layers. I mean, one, it's considered to be the best, uh, one of the best sources and maybe the purest source for studying the Beijing dialect of Mandarin. That is various ways, turns of phrase and expressions in the Beijing dialect. If one thinks about Beijing itself, there are some very uh, unique dialectical ways of speaking in Beijing. The, it's a so-called, the dialect is, some, some people call it R Hua because it has the R sound within it. You don't say Yi Dian, you say Yi Yar, or um, 
以以呃呃以以画啊 ，lots of art in in the in the dialect. Even 今天 and 明天 in 今天 meaning uh, uh today, 明天 meaning tomorrow. In Beijing, one would hear uh, 今天 is 今儿，明天 tomorrow is 明儿 So so the dialect of Beijing is. Something that is very much expressed within Cao Shuqing's novel, but also turns of phrase that are specific to to Beijing. The novel is full of puns and metaf metaphors, which which uh, I shall discuss later. The, the the color red is not only embedded in the novel's title, but the color red appears throughout the narrative. Uh, it's connected to the metaphor of Hong Chan, Hong uh, red Chan meaning dust. Uh, from the Buddhist point of view, red dust is is a thin Red dust that gets on our clothing and we can't get it off. It's、uh, really a metaphor for the illusions of the world, for our desires and, and wants in this world. Once we become lustful, once we become desiring, then we have allowed the red dust to soil us, and it's not hard. It's not easy to、uh, get rid of it. It's quite hard to get rid of. So the material world、uh, and its its empty attractions. The allurements of the world that stick to us like dust, home. So reality is an illusion.、Uh, reality and illusion、uh, are are constantly conjured, and they're constantly indistinguishable through the narrative in Dream of the Red Chamber. So so the reader must rely on gossip between minor characters for information about what is going on with the major characters. There's gossip. Reality, a step removed, becomes a way of accessing what's going on. So the novel be,、uh, continues to be read in several ways, and its authorship has, has still is still a hot topic of, of research. During the Qing Dynasty,、uh, no one had settled for certain on who the author was. I think people knew it was Cao Shuiqin, certainly,、um, uh, but Hu Shi identified the features. Of the novel that demonstrate its its autobiographical relationship with Cao Shuiqi, who should have really、uh, proved really beyond a doubt that、uh, Cao Shuiqi is the author of the novel.、Um, we still debate about the last forty chapters. But in the nineteen fifties, Marxists paid attention not so much to the authorship and the meaning of the novel、uh, as、uh, as Cao Shuiqi intended, but pay, basically paid attention to the novel's attack on China's ancient feudal system. Um, I believe my cat is coming to to pass pass by, but、uh, in any case, uh, uh, today in libraries and uh, United States uh, in, in in libraries in the United States and other places, there are large sections of the library collection that discuss this novel.、Uh, I want to end with just about three minutes of of or a couple minutes、uh, of of description about what. The novel will intellectually engage、uh, the so-called three teachings, the San Jiao in, in Chinese,、uh, in the Chinese intellectual tradition. The San Jiao, the three teachings, really are Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. All three of those are represented in the novel.、Uh, in the Confucian sense, one sees this dialectic between Li, ritual, and Ren, benevolence.、Um, ritual being that. That 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 system of behavior that mitigates the awkwardness in how should we behave、right? to be benevolent. And here's my other cat, right? And, well, I think he's eager to leave. So in any case,、um, in Confucianism, you see、uh, a lot of consideration of ritual behavior, of, of social expectations, of Confucian morality, especially from the Neo-Confucian point of view, vis-a-vis a pushback to the Neo-Confucian. Notion of morality in the so-called cult of Qing.、Uh, in Taoism, you will see a lot of use of polarity of yin and yang, of true and false,、uh, up and down, male and female. That、uh, in, that exchange of, of of polarities is something that that appears quite frequently throughout the narrative. And then, of course, Buddhism with its critique of desire, its critique of attachment, its critique of Of those things that that perpetuate karma,、um, its critique of of the the what Buddhism would consider the ill effects of the illusory nature of what we think of as reality. Certainly, 
all of those things in the novel will appear. Um, well, when we, again, when we look at the Ningua house, we see something of a Taoist representation. When we look at the Rongguo house, we see something of a Confucian uh, uh, connotation, but all of it is somehow swimming in the waters of Buddhism, and all of it is also rejecting the waters of Buddhism, rejecting the waters of Taoism, rejecting the waters of Confucianism, while completely accepting them. Well, uh, with all of that, uh, there is so much more to say, but as I am want to do through this time, Juni Manshanti Jen Kang, I wish you all very good health. Um, if you want to know what happens next, stay tuned until the next post. As we would say in the, in the novel, stay tuned until the next chapter. Ganbei.